Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. And thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us on another edition of the J-Boy Show. Really excited to talk some recruiting, talk some SEC landscape. Going to get into the national landscape a little bit when it comes to the transfer portal. But first, got to give a shout-out to our partners at betonline.ag. Head over there today. The online casino is always open. We got the NBA playoffs. You got great props, uh, parlays, however you want to do it. We got Major League Baseball, a ton of stuff going on. They have great sharp sign-up bonuses, everything you need in one spot, and They've got unbelievable sign-up bonuses. I'll say it again and again and again because I know that's what y'all are looking for. So head over to betonline.ag today and tell them that Jay boy sent you. But without further ado, excited to welcome National Director of Recruiting, Mike Farrell, to the show. Mike, it's always a pleasure bringing you on. No problem. I'm actually, uh, I got a new title. I'm the National Columnist now. So, I mean, it's not a big deal, but it's uh, it allows me to broaden the scope a little bit and cover the NFL draft and the portal a little bit more exclusively, a little less high school. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, man. Congratulations. I know you guys are making big moves over there. So national columnist. Uh, now I know there's going to be even more big things coming uh, from Mike Farrell over there. And speaking about big things, Mike, you know, something mean you talked about getting on TikTok, a space that it's a little bit different. We're both still kind of learning a little bit. It's, it's pretty interesting. It's not built for us at all. It's, it's, you know, it's just ridiculous, but I got to try, right? It's, it. a, it's a social media platform. You're reaching new people, so you got to try. But it's 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 almost embarrassing, but I don't care. Yeah, it is really interesting and, and a fun space, and I'm excited to see more videos that come out. We're obviously going to be putting more there. But uh, I do want to talk about the transfer portal, Mike, because it's something you guys have covered. We talked about a ton here, and it's changed the game. Whether you look at college basketball, college football, all through sports, uh, it's almost like having free agency. But there's a couple teams that have taken advantage of it the most. Who are a couple teams in your mind uh, that, that have really taken the most advantage? I mean, you look at Georgia, obviously, helping the back end. But what are some, uh, including them, that have really taken advantage of the transfer portal and upped uh, their ante going into this next season? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a combination of new, you know, new coaches mm -hmm. and um, established coaches that need help. So, you know, when you talk about UCF and Gus Malzahn, he's done an amazing job in the portal with a lot of, uh, you know, Auburn kids, but also kids that he had connections to that he recruited when he was at Auburn and um, Michigan State, <clears throat> Mel Tucker, I mean, is living in the portal. Um, a little dangerous to do so, I think, because it's too early to see how the portal is going to affect college football and how these kids will pan out. And they're in the portal for a reason. Either they weren't playing enough, they're homesick, or they got other issues. So um, that's dangerous. But when you talk about the big national title contenders you know georgia's definitely comes to mind um uh, you know darian kendrick the the five-star cornerback at clemson is supposed to announce next week that he's going to georgia alabama um you know yeah. they, they've gotten some speed at wide receiver but they also got henry tuoto um at linebacker which which fills a need for them um but i think pretty much every program like usc's used it a lot texas has used it here and there um you know, it, it's very rare to think of a program that isn't using it. I mean, Dabo Swinney said he wasn't going to use it. Um, and then he got beat by Justin Fields. And uh, <laughs> it's a transfer quarterback there. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where you have to use it. Um, and, and Auburn's another one that, that's used it very well. But tracking it is a pain. Um, it's real difficult to try to get a feel for who has what and what academics are in place and, and who's going where and all that stuff. But um, I think it's, it's the future of college football. Um, they just need to fix it a little bit. Yeah. And, and my biggest question, cause I, I try and look at it from a coaching perspective too, is if I'm a new coach, if I'm a coach that's even been there, how do you build culture? How do you build a foundation when you have older guys coming and going, you have guys that can leave at any point in time. If something goes wrong the first time, instead of sticking it out and letting that help them to the end, leaving to go to another place, because it's really just a sliding glass door right now. And if I'm a head coach, it's really tough to really tough to put that foundation in and keep it there year after year. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. And when you mentioned culture, the first place that came to mind was Florida State, another one that's, that's really doing a lot of work in the transfer portal. And <clears throat> I don't know. Um, sometimes your culture is so bad that bringing in new people will be good. It's a good um, one. You know, sometimes you could bring in a leader like a Mackenzie Milton, um, who's been there, done that, overcome adversity and and can really settle a program um and then other times 
it could be chaos. And, and I think we're going to see a little bit of both of that uh, on the field this season and moving forward. You know, it's, it's similar to JUCOs. Very few schools relied on JUCOs uh, primarily. Uh, Kansas State and Bill Snyder somehow did it. You know, half his class seemed to be JUCOs every year. Um, but some schools spot recruited JUCOs, maybe added five every year to fill in spots that needed immediate help for experienced guys. But those JUCO guys, you know, you know, one out of five pan out to be what you expect. Um, because again, they're in JUCO for a reason. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see. It, it, but this is, you know, you're going to have to adapt quickly to your new teammates. That's just the way it is. Um, and, you know, culture has to be created in the off season. It has to be created in the summer workouts. It has to be created in the, in the winter conditioning. And, and that's difficult when guys are out the door uh, and then new guys are coming in and you don't know who they are. So the culture question is a great one. And you are really beholden to the portal. I, I mean, you, you can't wish an all SEC offensive tackle into the portal to help you. You kind of kind of get it where you can get it and you're beholden to the portal. But speaking of, of big time guys on the move, or at least possibly on the move, Eric Gilbert is probably the most talked about right now. We know the situation at LSU last year. There's been some smoke to LSU. There's maybe some smoke to Georgia. The grade situation is very interesting. Will it be Juco? Uh, will he play college or junior college? Really, at the end of the day, Micah, what are you hearing on Eric Gilbert? And where should fans kind of lean right now? Here's the it's a it's an ever evolving situation. Okay, there's a family dynamic involved. There's also um, academic issues involved because, you know, he he left at the end of uh, his first semester of college. So my assumption is he, had, he didn't complete those classes no. and he's not gonna get grades for those classes. So he doesn't have you know, bad grades, he has no grades. Um, but I, there has been some talk and rumor that he's been taking some JUCO classes. Uh, there's been some talk about, he, he accelerated in high school. He didn't, he didn't reclassify but he was taking college level courses as a senior. Um, his mom is an educator, has been a teacher for years. She knows what she's doing when it comes to, you know, getting him situated in the right place and, and academically eligible for the NCAA. Um, so there's all that. There's also some off field stuff and then there's the on field talent. So it's really a mixed bag. I don't think he's going back to LSU. I think he wants to go back to LSU. I don't think there's a family agreement for him to go back to LSU. So where does that leave him? Um, you know, I've heard Georgia, uh, but I don't know. You know, Georgia's got a pretty good tight end situation. Yeah, and again, Darnell's pretty good. Yeah, and you don't want to, like, break, they got Brock Bowers coming in. You don't want to upset the apple cart in the transfer portal and lose a high school recruit for a risk, you know? So – he's a, he's a very good risk. He's so talented, but you know, I've heard Tennessee because Harrison Bailey, um, yeah. you know, is quarterback in high school. Um, I, I've also heard some other schools. I mean, which is interesting. I'm coming out with my column on Wednesday transfer rumor column. And, and, and one of those schools I'll mention is, is Alabama. Um, now I don't know if Alabama's interested. I, I'm digging into that this week. Um, but he's extremely interested in Alabama. That was his first choice, if you remember, before he decided to go to LSU because they told him they could play wide out. Um, so will he end up at college? I don't know. I think he will because he's in good hands. I think is is, and I don't know him. I don't know his mom. This is all like digging, 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 right? Eric doesn't talk about this. His family doesn't talk about this. His old coaches don't talk about this. He still has a red shirt too, right? Still has a red shirt here. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he, he's got he's got plenty of eligibility left. He's got talent off the charts. He wants to go to the league, right? Yeah. So in two years, he wants to be a first round draft pick. Um, so get on the field as soon as possible is his goal. Uh, I I have assumption it's going to be college. I just don't know which college at this point, but I do not think it's going to be LSU right now. 
Well, think about adding Eric Gilbert to a roster like Georgia's or like Alabama's. I mean, if you're Tennessee, that's the shot of momentum you need. There's the matchup for Josh Heupel, uh, a guy that can dictate how they're going to cover you or at least give you an idea of how they're going to cover you. I mean, but if you put him with Todd Munkin and JT Daniels next to Darnell Washington at tight end, uh, that's a pretty daggum good group. And then with Latu uh, and Billingsley, who really is a flex wide, more of a wide receiver, uh, just adds another dynamite NFL player to that roster. So that's going to be interesting to see. And speaking about interesting, if you're trying to get interest in your son, daughter to be recruited, you want to get him in front of coach's eyes, you need to download the Dynasty U app right now. That's Dynasty U. It's in Google Play. Anywhere you get your apps, it's like a LinkedIn for high school recruits or anybody that's trying to get noticed. Emailing the coach 30 times about your son or daughter is not the best way to go about it. Trust me, down this app, create a profile. It has academics, highlights, everything that you could possibly need to put into a profile for a recruiter to see. College coaches already, I know, love it. I've gotten messages about it already from directors of recruiting, DFOs, all type of stuff. So you need to download Dynasty U right now and it's absolutely free. That's Dynasty U. But we're here with Mike Farrell, national columnist uh, from Rivals. Really excited talking a little transfer portal. Uh, Going to transition here to some, some current recruiting outside of transfers. Uh, and you look at a guy uh, like Kamari Wilson. And I know there's a lot of love for Georgia. A lot of people think he's leaning that way, including us. But he's going to take some visits. We know how crazy recruiting is. How do you feel about Kamari Wilson and, and where he's at in his recruitment right now? I talked to somebody last week, and I believe this is all Georgia. Yeah. That's my feeling. Um, you know, and it wasn't even, and this is one of the schools involved with them. And, and it wasn't even, uh, and, it, and, when it, and it wasn't Georgia. It wasn't even a question, really. Um, you know, and you rarely hear that. You know, you hear, oh, well, it depends on this visit, that visit. Now, I don't think he's taking these visits just for fun. Um, I think he really wants to do his research and see where he wants to go. But um, I, I think heading into visits, he's all Georgia. And I think coming out of all visits, you know, he's going to be all Georgia as well. It's just my guess on him. Um, I don't want to kill the drama. Because <laughs> anything can happen in recruiting. I mean, God, so many guys that have been all one school and then end up, you know, falling in love on a visit. Um, and, and like I said, he's not taking these visits for no reason. So, but right now, Futurecast is in for Georgia, not changing it at all. Yeah, you don't really see Kirby losing battles like that, especially with all the momentum in the big year possibly coming. Uh, Kamari Wilson does look like he's going to be headed to Georgia. But another guy, a DB out of a school uh, that got a lot of pub last year, uh, one of the top high schools in Texas of North Shore, Demetrius Davis, quarterback signed with Auburn, Jaden Roberts, offensive lineman signed with Alabama, one of the best DBs in the country, Denver Harris. Uh, a lot of people think he's leaning Alabama. That's where you know he's going to take a visit, obviously. And again, like I said with Kamari, you never know in recruiting. But right now, I mean, if, if – you're Denver Harrison, you're a DB. It's tough not to go to Alabama with the amount of first rounders they're putting out every year. No, I, th I think he's leaning Alabama. So you look at the visits, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, I was watching the equalizer the other night with Denzel Washington. <laughs> okay, right? good with Denzel. Okay. Follow good. the money, right? Yeah. Follow the visits here. Um, Texas A&M's his first visit. LSU's his second visit. Texas his third visit. And his final visit is to Alabama. Weird. So yeah. Now, I originally, when he, when he was a sophomore, I predicted he would go to Alabama, and everybody got on me and said, I'm an idiot, as usual, you know, because I get a lot of that. Um, you know, because I, I, in talking to this kid initially, he wants to be great, and he wants to be pushed to be great. You know, so a lot of people thought it would be Texas. A lot of people thought it would be at LSU with Corey Raymond and, and what they do there, and, and that was definitely uh, intriguing. But he always struck me as an Alabama guy. The way he talked about Nick Saban, the way he talked about the development of those players there, so when he wasn't talking Alabama as much over the last like six months, it was surprising to me. And, and I saw, you know, a lot of Texas future casts and I saw some people saying LSU, but I've got Alabama. I haven't locked it in yet though. Um, you know, this is closer than Kamari. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's going to take his time, but he, he strikes me as an Alabama kid and it's hard to beat them for, anybody and and you know the state of texas is being raided and you know alabama can go in there and, and pretty much get anybody they want at times yeah i'd be surprised to see denver harris not end up at alabama with when nick saban keys in on a guy he's typically going to get him especially at that defensive back position which is one of the many special teams but kind of the forte i guess uh you could say of nick saban and that would be another huge pickup in what has been uh amazing class after amazing class uh but you know it's amazing the way that recruiting has changed and how much more business like it is and i talk about this on the show all the time mike 
you know, gone really, except for rare circumstances are the times where, oh, you grew up here, you grew up a fan of this school, so you're going to go there. Nowadays, it's a business. The kid thinks he's going to the league. The parents think he's going to the league, and they want to set him up in the best position to be able to earn that paycheck and continue his career. Uh, that's something as a guy that's followed recruiting as closely as long as you have, Mike. Are you seeing that change in the landscape, and is that the direction we're moving? Yeah, so, you know, uh, on the front page of Rivals, I did a fact or fiction. You know, I do those every couple of days. Yeah, and, um, Quinn Ewers mentioned something about, you know, why kids aren't staying in Texas. And he's obviously was committed to Texas and then decommitted. He's all locked in for Ohio State, it seems. And, you know, his, his reasoning was simple and it was very, very smart. And he's a heady kid. He gets it. And it's not rocket science. They haven't been a national title contender since, what, 2009? Maybe, it's been a lot. you know, it's been a very, very long time. And these kids want to gravitate towards uh, championships, first round draft picks. Sometimes it's academics. You know, I mean, Walker Little obviously chose Stanford for more than a four year decision, but he's, he's off to Jacksonville now and he's doing pretty well. But, you know, the guys like the Jeffrey Okudas of the world or the J.K. Dobbins of the world or or the Denver Harris's of the world from, from Texas, they want to go where they can win a national championship. C.D. Lamb going to Oklahoma. That's just the way it is. Um, and until Texas shows that they can compete and they need to get in the playoff, they will continue to lose kids. Now, where does A&M fit in here? You know, that's a home state school. They recruit very well. They get five stars. But they lost on Jalen Waddell when a lot of people didn't expect them to. Why? Because Jalen Wada wanted to go win a national championship and be a first rounder. Well, he did that at Alabama and other kids see that. Um, and that's why they're going to gravitate towards these programs. The proof is there. It's not difficult to find. Um, and that's why the kids are leaving Texas. Yeah, and Steve Sarkeesian, again, he's going to have to start chipping away and winning some of these battles. We know how important the state of Texas is. And again, it's so business-like now. you got to put results on the field and you got to win and, you know, another big shift in recruiting this coming is we get visits back, Mike, and we know how important that is for everybody, for every school. But for some schools, it's way more important than the others. Auburn and Brian Harson is a great example. Uh, what are some other schools that you think are really going to benefit uh, from being able to have visits? I know that may sound like a, a mundane and generic question, but there are some schools that get more out of those visits and rely on those visits uh, more heavily than others. Yeah, I mean, Obviously, any new staff, and, and, and Brian Arson's lucky. I mean, try to be Mike Norvell, right, uh -huh. or any of the new coaches last season who are trying to, to rebuild a program and can't visit kids and can't have kids visit and don't have a summer camp to evaluate and find kids and establish those relationships with those 2023s and 2024s. That was an impossible situation for those new coaches. So Arson coming in now, again, June is not as – as, as, as good as April, but yeah. we'll take it, you know, um, now they're actually getting out there. They get to see you face to face. There's less zoom. I mean, the zoom is always going to be a part of recruiting now um, forever, but I think in addition to, you know, an Auburn, I honestly think it's important for like a Florida, yeah. um, which is sounds weird, but they're not recruiting at the level they should be. Um, and they need those on-campus visits. They need, and you would think, oh, kids can just drive into Florida, right? They didn't, they didn't. During the, during the pandemic, there weren't a lot of visits. Um, you know, Tennessee's another one. It's crucial for them to have these official visits and to get these kids on campus. Um, you know, Ole Miss, it, it, the Georgias and Alabamas of the world are always gonna be okay. Texas a and is gonna be fine. Um, it's the other programs, that really need these visits to try to sell these kids off of those established programs that are going to win it all. Will it work? I don't know. I mean, Arson's he's, he's a year behind. And by that, I mean, you know, he's a new coach, yeah. but these kids haven't taken visits in two years. So I think you're going to see more of an impact in the 2023, 2024 class for Auburn than you will in the 2022, but this is the start of it. And it's important to establish those relationships. Yeah, Mike, and now I want to shift to uh, kind of projecting and talking about some on-the-field stuff, and I want to start in the West and look at with what Alabama's done, it'd be crazy to bet against them, even though they're replacing a lot. They don't rebuild, they reload, and, and we know the expectation and the standard that's been laid there, but who are some teams in that second tier? You look at LSU, you look at Texas A&M, you've got Auburn, you know, Ole Miss right there, Arkansas with Sam Pittman. Who do you think are going to be the teams in that second tier right under Alabama if 
what typically happens happens at least in the past uh, handful of years in the SEC West. Yeah, Alabama is going to win. I mean, you just might as well say that. There's no reason to bet against them, despite the fact that they're losing so much. Um, second tier to me, uh, I really like the talent at LSU. <clears throat> A lot of young, young talent. Um, you know, now Ed Orgeron fell into sort of the the perfect storm of 2019. Um, I don't know if that's ever going to happen again for Ed Orgeron. I think he's a good coach, but I don't think he's an elite coach. Um, and then you look at AM, and and that's really the second tier in the West right now. You got too many other question marks elsewhere um, to really consider anybody else. AM could push for sure. Um, Old Miss is tricky because of Corral and they've got a really good receiving core, but that defense was so bad that you, you wonder if Kiffin can fix that in time to make a run. But I look at right now, Alabama, Texas A&M, and LSU in that order, and I'm flipping, flopping between A&M and LSU because I do like the talent a little bit better at LSU overall, uh, but I like the defense at A&M a little better, and I think defense, you know, defense is going to play a part in a national championship again. I mean, it, everybody's just looking at 2019, 2020, and it's never going to happen again. It will, um, and, and that's where I, I like Alabama so much, but it's also why I like A&M. Yeah, I agree. I actually have LSU finishing second. I got them at Texas A&M going five and three in the SEC. LSU hosts Texas A&M the last game of the regular season. I think they're going to win that. Therefore, winning the tiebreaker uh, should be a hell of a race. A bunch of great storylines. Mike Leach, year two. Lane Kiffin, year two, with hopefully a little bit of a revamp defense. Arkansas and Sam Pittman, as I mentioned earlier, and obviously the new hires. But looking at the East, uh, the common... I and the common denominator would tell you that Georgia is by far the favorite. Physically, they're the best. Athletically, they're the best. Depth-wise, they're up there. I've got Kentucky and Missouri making a run for that second-tier spot. You look at Florida with what they lost. Where do you have that second tier in the East to kind of mirror my question earlier about the West? Yeah, you know, Mullen said some things. You know, he didn't come out and blatantly say that he wants the NFL, but he said some things about the portal and about recruiting and about other things that aren't as attractive in college football as, you know, a, an offer to coach an NFL team where you don't have to deal with that stuff. And I think the feeling is at least amongst the, the, those without knowledge. I don't know, Dan Mullen, Dan Mullen doesn't share anything with me as far as his feelings or where he's going to go or whatever is that. I think <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's got a foot out the door. That's, yeah. that's the impression. I don't know if it's true, you know, but he has to change that feeling in recruiting and publicly because that's the feeling. Um, now, Florida is clearly to me, uh, I think the number two in the SEC East, um, even with, you know, Emory Jones being a question mark at quarterback, being new, even with all the losses at, at wide receiver, they've got some defensive talent. Um, you know, it depends on whether Grantham can get them all together and on the same page, but Georgia has to win a national championship. And I think they have to win it this year. Um, oh, I think it's crazy if they don't, the defense is so good. Then you add, you know, Ty Key Smith and you're adding Darian Kendrick, you're fixing the one problem, which is the defensive backfield. You've got the wide receivers, even with Pickens injured. You've got the two-headed monster, three-headed monster running back. And you got JT Daniels uh, and, and a solid offensive line. You have to win it this year. That's it. I mean, this is set up. If, if JT goes off to the NFL, you lose Pickens and you lose some of those defensive guys, then you're back, you know, you're good, but you're not at that top tier. Um, and then after that, you know, you, you have to look at uh, Kentucky and Missouri. Um, you know, I like Missouri's offense. I like Kentucky, the fact that their offensive line is going to be nasty yeah. and that's going to keep them in football games and allow them to control the clock in some situations. So that, that's the second tier to me, but it, again, it starts Georgia and then drops down to Florida and then we'll see what happens after that. But Georgia short of Ohio state probably has the biggest edge. I would say in any division, well, Clemson, but it's such a gap talent wise that this is it if Kirby doesn't win it this year he, he's going to be under extreme pressure yeah I agree and it's his best shot you know Kirby has his best team and as I mentioned Alabama's replacing a lot even though uh, as we alluded to they just reload but uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure for him to win this year and I think it's his best chance and with them shoring up the back end 
You talked about Ty Key. Uh, they add Kendrick. Now it's going to be a strength almost, and you don't have to alter a ton on defense. With the defensive line, they have Jordan Davis, monster. You look at that front seven. They're really, really talented, and I think it's their best shot. And you're right. Listen, when you haven't won it since 1980, there's going to be a lot of pressure. All these recruiting classes that, that have amassed, you know, as you mentioned, and that we talk about regularly, regularly on here, Georgia fans want a national champion. Uh, it's nice to go to the dance, but it's nice to be the prettiest girl to dance. But I will push back on the people that say that Kirby Smart is Mark Rick. There's a big stat, in my opinion, that differs that. Mark Rick, the longest he had Georgia in the top 10 was for 10 weeks. Last year, going into the Mississippi State game, or the week of the Mississippi State game, Kirby Smart had had Georgia in the top 10 for 45 straight weeks. That's a big discrepancy, but they got to win it this year, or they're going to be chirping even more in Athens. You know, Mark Rick was a average coach and a good recruiter. Kirby, to me, has shown he's an average coach and a great recruiter. But he needs to win it all to become a great coach. Um, you know, Ed Orgeron's done it. Um, you know, now it's time for Kirby to step up and show that he's more than just a recruiter. And, and I think Georgia can do that. I've, you know, I picked Oklahoma as my preseason number one. That, that doesn't mean I think they're going to win the national championship. It's just that the path to the playoff for them, uh, just like Ohio State, is very, very clear, just like Clemson is very clear. The SEC will probably win another national championship. It's probably going to be either Georgia or Alabama. Um, and I think this is Georgia's year to get it done. Now, he won't be on the hot seat or anything like that, but, you know, people will get tired. They'll, they'll, they'll be like, listen, we're getting close. All these number one recruiting classes, what are you doing? And they're not popping out first rounders left and right. Um, that's another thing as far as player development, people are going to start to question that. So uh, it, unfortunately for Kirby, he's, he's been good enough to now have the pressure to be great. Yeah. And he's going to have to live up to that. I agree with you. I got Georgia winning it unless something crazy happens. There's a lot of time before the season kicks off and we all know about prognostications, but Mike, it's always great stuff, man. National columnist now uh, for rivals uh, uh, getting even deeper in his bag. Excited for you. Uh, you deserve it, brother. And thank you for joining us. Tell people where they can find you as well uh, on social media, TikTok, wherever. Yeah, so apparently I'm going to be sharing more opinions, which people hate. So I'm going to be getting more hate um, on social media at Rivals Mike at Twitter, Rivals Godfather on Instagram, uh, Mike Farrell Sports on Facebook, and then, of course, Rivals Godfather on TikTok. All right, Mike, thanks again, man. It's always great. Appreciate you guys for joining us as well. Head over to jboyshow.com, grab some merch, subscribe, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Got some more big announcements coming. Make sure you stay tuned. We're growing like a weed. Uh, keep spreading the word. It's been another edition of the J-Boy Show. J-Boy's going, going. Go on. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with The J-Boy Show.